Good morning, San Francisco. Very good morning and early morning. Good afternoon, London, Croatia and Cairo. I am in Beirut and welcome to Beirut Institute Summit ePolicy Circle number 10. And we have a great cast with us today. Of course, Sir John Sawyers, former chief of the Secret Intelligence Service MI6, former permanent representative of the UK at the UN, where I got the pleasure of knowing you. Uh, of course, right now you are the independent non-executive director of BP Global and executive chairman of Newbridge Advisory. Brett McGurk, uh, who joined us last year at Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi, welcome to the e-policy circle. Uh, he is former special assistant to President George W. Bush and senior director of Iraq and Afghanistan, former deputy assistant secretary of state for Iraq and Iran, special presidential envoy for the United States campaign against ISIS under President Barack Obama. He is now a paying distinguished lecturer at Stanford University. Her Excellency Rani al Mashat is Egypt's Minister of International Cooperation, former Minister of Tourism and previously advisor to the Chief Economist of the IMF. And we have Ambassador Yue Chiang Yong, I hope I didn't butcher that. He's a China Forum expert, former ambassador to Qatar, Jordan and Ireland. He's director and senior fellow at the Center for Global Studies at Renmin University in China, of China, and he is now in Croatia. He's joining us from Croatia. Welcome, as it goes, four minutes to each of you, uh, three and a half to four minutes to bring to the table what you wish, and I will start with Dania Mashat. It's uh, to you right now. Tell us what you have, what you'd like us to learn about international cooperation, the dossier that you're holding in the Ministry of uh, Egypt. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Rada, and uh, it's a pleasure to be joining uh, such uh, expertise uh, on, uh, on many topics, uh, and I see everyone has a relationship with the region, and that is uh, uh, extremely, extremely important for this discussion uh, going forward. Maybe what I would like uh, to focus on is uh, the concept of multilateralism. Uh, of course, uh, there are so many debates uh, going on. Uh, is cooperation we getting weaker? Uh, is, uh, is everyone on their own? Uh, what, what, what is the world going to look like uh, post-COVID when it comes to uh, international cooperation and collaboration? And what I want to start saying is that um, this crisis has shown that no country lives by itself in isolation. What has started as a health uh, uh, issue has actually propagated into uh, economic and social uh, uh, headaches for, for, for different countries. Uh, lives have been affected when it comes to livelihoods and jobs. And uh, when we think about, uh, uh, you know, every country having uh, sort of a, a place on the table, uh, what this crisis has shown us uh, that uh, the shared experience, uh, whether it has to do uh, with how to deal with the health situation or actually how to take policies related to mitigating uh, the socioeconomic implications has been extremely, extremely telling. Um, and uh, maybe uh, as we're talking about the region, uh, a few points that uh, I want to highlight, uh, and this is a work that we are doing uh, with Regional Action Group, uh, with the World Economic Forum. It includes uh, uh, public sector uh, representatives from different countries in the region. It also uh, includes private sector representatives and it includes civil society. And what we uh, talk about is, uh, or what we try to address is uh, the stakeholder capitalism under this, uh, uh, you know, post COVID, how are countries in the region, uh, how can they engage together to actually uh, overcome many of these uh, obstacles that have, uh, have happened. And the idea is scaling up the national reactions or the national uh, actions taken by governments so that uh, this whole debate about uh, are global uh, supply chains being interrupted? Are they going to be replaced by local and regional supply chains? So many of these issues. Uh, the first one has to do with um, accelerating inclusive economies and societies. As we know, uh, many countries have taken uh, fiscal and monetary measures uh, to uh, fend off the implications of COVID. That, me that means that uh, social safety nets have been uh, widened. That means that more vulnerable groups have been addressed. In the case of Egypt, for instance, we have close to one and a half million uh, workers who are in the informal sector have become more formal. So there are many structural reforms that were uh, on the back burner pushed forward because 
uh, uh, governments really want to uh, try and uh, see the light after COVID. The second one has to do uh, with uh, fourth industrial revolution. As we see, most of our webinars and meetings today uh, are done uh, through technology. Uh, in our case, uh, schools and education were done online. Uh, we have a very young population uh, in the region and, and therefore uh, they're more technologically savvy than uh, 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 others and how can we leverage on that? Uh, the third point, which is very important, is how we look at environment. Today, with all these uh, fiscal stimulus on projects, how do we ensure that there's a green recovery? In our case, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, projects that are being uh, pushed forward to create jobs and mitigate the implications have to have a 30% uh, 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 consistency with uh, environmental rules. So these are, this is a, a very important uh, uh, issue also related to some of the environmental challenges in the region related to water, related to uh, 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 the desertification, related to the, the hot weather. So green recovery is something uh, that we are doing in Egypt, but also with my colleagues uh, uh, in, in, in the region, uh, other countries are looking at. And the fourth one has to do with regional integration. Uh, studies have shown uh, that uh, trade, intra-trade in the region is very, very modest. You're talking about 16%. If we look at Asia, if we look at Europe, it's much higher. So how can we look at the complementarities between the countries to actually improve that? I will stop there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rania and Mashat. I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be an engaging conversation on these points that you raised when we open the floor for a conversation, the global conversation that we have in these e-policy circles. I'm gonna go now to Sir John Sawyers. To you, please, four minutes. Thank you, Raghida. And um, <clears throat> I think Rania has, uh, the Minister Mashat has set a very good uh, framework for the economic uh, aspects of this discussion. Um, <clears throat> it, it is very striking that the COVID virus, uh, uh, when it hit us all, the responses were rather fragmented. They were very national based. Uh, and quite often they were competitive. They were closing borders, they were, um, uh, fighting for essential medical equipment and, uh, and materials. Um, <clears throat> and it was uh, uh, certainly the first crisis in my lifetime uh, where we didn't have the benefit of American leadership. Uh, American leadership isn't always uh, a pleasure, uh, but I think when the absence of American leadership is even worse. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's been very striking, uh, uh, that aspect of this particular uh, crisis. Um, and of course, we're only partway through it. We're seeing the numbers of cases around the world continuing to grow on a daily basis. And I'm very concerned in particular for areas with weaker health policy systems like India uh, and Pakistan or uh, Africa, including North Africa, uh, where the, um, uh, the first wave of the virus is only just, uh, is only just getting going. But if I look at the, um, <clears throat> Rania looked at the, uh, uh, the economic and regional aspects, if I look at the more global political and, and uh, geostrategic aspects, I think um, uh, the, we're going to emerge from this, this first wave of the virus, and, and, and I say emerge, we will be living with this virus for the next uh, year or two, I think. So we need to uh, find a new normal with the virus still with us. We can't just wait until the virus is, uh, is defeated or there's a new vaccine. It could be a long way off. But we're going to emerge from this process um, more divided uh, and, as Rania says, poorer. There's an economic recession going on in, in most uh, uh, parts of the world, certainly here in Europe um, <clears throat> and in Britain. Uh, and it's going to make it harder to come together to address the issues that we, uh, uh, that we need to address, whether it's public health or emerging from economic recession or dealing with global trade tensions. But even more difficult from that is I think the relationship between the world's two great powers, between the United States and China, has ta also taken a, a, a sharp turn for the worse. Uh, a lot of this is attributed to the um, uh, a more assertive approach by, by the United States uh, on economic issues. But also I think, um, and Ambassador Yu, I'm sure will, will, will comment on this, uh, and he won't agree with me, but there's been a more uh, aggressive Chinese behavior in the last year or so as well. We've seen it um, not just on the issue of, uh, of, of diplomacy around the COVID crisis, but we've also seen it on the borders with India. We've seen it in dealing with Hong Kong and uh, the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, um, in the South China Sea, and so on. There's a more um, uh, assertive China, as well as a more assertive uh, and national uh, United States. 
And I think as we look forward, the, the single most important issue for the long term is for the United States and China to find uh, a way of working together which suits both those countries and indeed the rest of the world. Uh, I th we haven't touched on the US elections coming up in November. I think these are going to be very important on a whole range of issues. But one of them will be on the uh, attitude of the United States to its uh, close allies. Um, uh, and it has very good alliances with Europe, with Japan and South Korea, with Australia and so on. And I would hope that um, uh, 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 with some confidence, if it's uh, a Biden administration, with a bit less confidence with Trump, but still with some uh, hope that, uh, that um, uh, building and retaining alliances becomes a very important feature for the United States over the coming four years, more so than it has been in the past. When we look at the Middle East region, um, uh, I know the Gulf reasonably well, I know Egypt uh, very well. Uh, I've been concerned about the impact of the virus uh, in these areas, but the economic impact um, uh, uh, caused by the collapse of oil and gas prices, there's going to be a lot of strain and stress in the region uh, because of loss of revenue. There's also greater competition between the powers of the region, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, uh, and I think that's going to be an issue we're going to have to address um, in the period ahead. Now, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Raghavan. I thank you very much, Sir John. We will definitely touch on all the things that you have mentioned, uh, from the Gulf region to Iran, to the uh, U.S.-China relations and its uh, impact. In fact, you have written a very interesting piece, a very impactful piece in the Financial Times, I believe, in which you pointed out to the cl closer relations between the U.S and Europe, uh, in a way, uh, lining up against China, provoked by Chinese actions, I'm uh, paraphrasing your words. However, we will also get into the U.S. elections and the impact of that. And, and speaking of the U.S., we're going to go to Brett Magog, whom uh, uh, we uh, have woken up so early in the morning at Stanford University. Please, Brett, four minutes to you. Uh, Raghat, thank you so much for having me. It's just a pleasure to be here. I wish we could all be in person as we were last year. I hope we get back to that again. Uh, but these policy circles have been so invaluable, and I hope people watch them. I was just watching some of them over the weekend. I think some of the most uh, engaged discussions, really extraordinary and extraordinary people, such as this panel. Very honored to be here. Um, I'll be brief, but as I'm here in the United States, I think it's kind of elephant in the room is what's happening here. And... Um, very uniquely, at least in my lifetime, we are in the midst of four interrelated crises domestically. Uh, we have this public health catastrophe. I think we have one of the, uh, one of the worst responses to COVID uh, in the world, which is, I think, shocking to most uh, Americans. Uh, we have an economic uh, catastrophe, which many are living through, but ours is now, uh, thought we were going to recover. It looks like that may now be uh, delayed. We have a ra racial justice uh, crisis uh, something our country's grappled with for uh, centuries is very much uh, upon us again. Um, and we have a governance crisis, just the basic competence of governance. I think the basic questioning, the competence of our authorities at the federal and local level is something that is very much called into question. So all of these interlapping crises at the same time is just leading to a real crisis in confidence. Um, all that said, we are 119 days away from an election. Uh, this is going to be a truly historic election, I think the most historic in my lifetime. And if you look at some of the trends in the United States, it seems like um, there is a, a mood, a trend to get out of this, uh, just the tumult and kind of return to some sense of, of uh, normalcy, normality, uh, which is what Joe Biden is really running on. So I'm not speaking for Biden, but I'm speaking as an American citizen. And I'm very hopeful you know, kind of interwoven into our founding documents, we're always striving to be better, a more perfect union. That's very much a moment that we're in as a country. And I think we're, we might actually come out of this uh, in a better place as a country. Now, where does the Middle East, where does our foreign policy kind of fit into that? Um, I think it's conventional wisdom that in terms of the U.S. position in the Middle East, it's not going to have the same priority that it ha has had in, in recent years. That's kind of conventional wisdom. Um, I kind of push back a little bit on that. And I, I just mentioned to people having dealt with these issues ne nearly for two decades, you know, we, we may be less interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is very much interested in us. And I think the old paradigms, energy, Iran, Saudi, all those, that's all there. Um, but the kind of new trend lines, the trend lines that are really shaping the future, not just of 2021, but 2040, 2050, uh, climate, artificial intelligence, technology, uh, shock and energy markets, just fundamental transformations that'll be global. 
they're all accelerated in the Middle East. And they're accelerated in the Middle East because of the state of conflict, the state of rivalries. So you take cyber, there's active cyber conflicts going on in the Middle East. You take technology. I dealt with this in the ISIS campaign. I'm here in Silicon Valley. There's a debate about the future of war and artificial intelligence. I point out for a while in the Battle of Mosul, uh, ISIS controlled, we control the airspace at 30,000 feet. ISIS controlled it at 5,000 feet for almost a week by using uh, uh, adapted drones, uh, off the shelf technology. So all of these things in the Middle East move very fast. And if we don't deal with them in a, in a way that develop norms, um, we could really have a free for all. So that's why the Middle East is so important, not only the old paradigms, which are still there, but these very new, these, these trends that will shape uh, the global, uh, the, the, the globe really in the next 20, 30 years. They're accelerating the Middle East, we need to be able uh, to deal with them. But where might we get back to, uh, assuming uh, we get out of that, and I served for two years in the Trump administration, so I know it very well, um, assuming we come out of this, um, I just think you look for a return to kind of first principles. And I'm going to, I'm going to dovetail off what Sir John said, just the first principles of our of foreign policy. What is it we're trying to achieve? What are our objectives? And, and in terms of once we have a defined objective, what are the resources that will be put towards it? And how will we achieve it? And that means we have to be very clear with our allies of what we're trying to do, get back to the fundamentals, the first principles of alliance building, alliance maintenance, diplomacy, which means persistence, which means compromise, it's hard, um, but kind of getting back to those first principles, and I think out of that, uh, we can come out in a much better place. Um, this will be difficult, but I'm actually fairly hopeful, even as we're all living through this, uh, these interlapping uh, crises. Very good, thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, cooperation, all of you, with the timing since I'm just waving at you all the time that your time is up. So I'm going to go now to Ambassador Yue Chia, Yue Chia Yong, please, four minutes to you. Thank you very much. And uh, this uh, uh, Radita Dahan, <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, uh, distinguished uh, experts uh, now, and I believe there are many audience are listening to us. Uh, first, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Radita Dahan to invite me for this opportunity. Uh, it's uh, really, I'm very happy to share my views as much as I can uh, for the themes uh, we have provided. I also want to concentrate. I, I think it's very enlightening after here, uh, those experts now, uh, this the opening statement. It, uh, it's a really very forward looking and uh, very factual finding. Uh, I give the theme of my statement as strive together for peace and stability with common development. This is actually what we China focus to do now. And we are, have been focusing to do in all these years when we launched the reform and open up. And we are going to focus to do in the years to come for the common development and a common prosperity. And uh, as, as, as just now, uh, His Excellency Rania O. Marshall has said in the beginning that to do this, we very much uh, hold that multilateralism is really a key as to how we saw all these problems. And there are not much difference with the problems and the challenges now facing humanity now with the COVID-19 and others. And sometimes China, we very much, very much emphasize that we come together, not only in the world, particularly in the region of the Middle East. It's really a very urgent necessity for humanity to unite, to pull collective efforts to maintain global peace, stability, and the development. And now, uh, I, I, only, I want to, as an opening statement, I want to share two things we are in China actually we are doing. One is just in the 6th July, we successfully uh, have our, uh, I think it's the ninth China Arab Forum. And in this forum, our president Xi Jinping uh, sent his written message 
and emphasizing the cooperation and the common purpose. And in this, in this, uh, I should say, the the forum meeting, we have quite an impressive document, outcome document. Uh, for example, we have a joint statement emphasizing how China and the 21 Arab states focusing on the solidarity of against the COVID-19. And we have an Amman declaration focusing how politically we support each other for the regional conflicts, for the, for the common issues and the Palestine issue and in the time of this so many challenging. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I just want to follow up with you on this. Did you just say that you just had an understanding with all Arab countries on, uh, on how you support each other on regional conflicts? I, th I thought that Arab countries uh, differ amongst well, each other regarding uh, regional conflicts. A, it's a, it, the Amman Declaration is we support each other for solving the problems, not for the conflict, right. and, uh, of course. And also we have the execution plan for 2020 to 2022. All this, the execution plan of the forum is for the practical cooperation, ranging from the economic development, the recovery from the COVID-19, all the way up to the science and technology cooperation and humanity exchanges and we all together, we actually have signed 107 cooperation documents in 20 areas. Thank so, you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Um, I need to move on to other things. It's okay, okay. Five minutes. It's already five minutes. Uh, I want to start up with the US elections. And I have a question for each and every one of you. So we're going to have to be crisp and fast with this one. Uh, in US elections, of course, you know, the results mean a lot to everybody. For the transatlantic relations, uh, Sir John Sawyers, what do you think? Are they gonna, would it make a difference who wins? It makes a huge difference. I think these are very consequential elections as, uh, as Brett uh, 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 described to us. <clears throat> I think they're going to be important for um, the direction of America. Uh, I don't think um, uh, a Biden administration would take us back to uh, the land of Obama world, if you like, the, uh, uh, you can't turn the clock back. Uh, but I think there will be a greater emphasis on common problems like uh, addressing the COVID crisis collectively, addressing climate change, as Brett mentioned, uh, and, and Rania mentioned, um, and, uh, and rebuilding America's alliances, which I think is a great multiplier uh, for, um, uh, uh, for American power and influence in the world. Uh, I, I think if, if we see a second Trump uh, uh, administration, it's for Americans to, to decide, of course, but I think it'll be much more difficult um, a much rockier ride for uh, 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 for the uh, uh, for the world because that stabilizing influence that we've had for the last uh, um, uh, seventy years uh, will not be there in the same uh, to the same degree uh, and I think also a Biden administration would approach the crucial relationship with China in a way of trying to find common ground and trying to address and resolve issues uh, uh, in a constructive way now whether they would succeed I don't know. Uh, but um, I, I, I think life would be a lot calmer, uh, uh, certainly for America's allies, if we see a Biden administration. And, and we'd have a chance to address the, the crucial issue of climate, which I think has uh, uh, been rather um, uh, 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 been squeezed out of the debate uh, because we've been so focused on, uh, on the COVID crisis. So John Sawyer's just voted for Biden, I would say, correct? Um, I don't have a vote. Yes, well, in, 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 in virtual votes. We are in a virtual world. Uh, Rania and Mashat, uh, Egypt, when one would think Egypt would worry if there is a Biden presidency because there will be a sort of a reset of the relationship to the time of President Obama, which really was not very good to Egypt. I mean, I understand your point about multilateralism and, and, uh, and about uh, the necessity of uh, paying attention to climate change, but it seems to me that Egypt was in a very big trouble when President Obama actually reset the relationship in a way that he stepped away from Egypt and the Gulf states and embraced Iran. Do you, uh, where do you, uh, where, how do you feel about that? Where do you stand on this? Uh, you know, uh, Egypt's relationship with the United States is very strategic and it's very old. 
And uh, when we take a look at uh, uh, whether it's a cooperation uh, with respect to economic ties, military ties, uh, they're very strategic. They have uh, been uh, there uh, regardless of who's in power or which uh, party uh, rules. This is something that the American people will have to decide. And uh, as uh, from where I stand, because we have a lot of work with uh, USAID and we have uh, lots of projects coming forward. So, uh, you know, the economic diplomacy that takes place, uh, uh, these are, these are uh, projects that really affect, uh, 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 you know, different, uh, not just the Egyptian people, but also with the different uh, firms, American firms that also provide this in Egypt. So it's a mutual uh, benefit, actually. Uh, so, I mean, again, uh, this is not uh, a decision for any uh, uh, citizens in the world except the Americans. And whatever the Americans are going to choose, uh, all of us will, uh, will have to definitely uh, move forward and, uh, and cooperate. Okay. Brett Magog, I, wouldn't you agree that uh, if it's a Biden presidency, it will impact the relationship with countries like Egypt because, of course, uh, of uh, the very nature of the relationship during President Obama? And then it, it is, in fact, the... Uh, Valerie Jarrett, who was the shadow president, as she's called, for President Obama, who was going to be the vice president for President uh, Biden. Isn't it uh, Obama revisited? Isn't that uh, what we should be expect, in specifically in terms of relations with the Arab region, with the Gulf region, and with Egypt in particular? Brett Magog? You're on mute, Brett. You're on mute, Brett. Sorry, I got it. Um, I have a little toddler running around, so I have it on mute sometimes. Oh, um, I, I will answer your question, but I, have a, I also have a question for uh, the ambassador, because I've, I've heard this. I was in Beijing a year or so ago with the Carnegie Foundation and heard the, the approach to the Middle East from China and that kind of friends with everybody and trying to solve problems. You're friends with Israel, friends with Iran, um, which my response was that's going to be very difficult to sustain because of the very <laughs> intractable uh, rivalries in the region. And you're going to have to take positions, which I think from what I hear from Chinese officials will make you uncomfortable. And then when you do take positions, again, you're not speaking for the government, but I'm, as I'm very privileged to be on the panel with you. Just yesterday in the Security Council, China used its veto, which you've rarely done uh, historically, uh, to veto just two humanitarian openings uh, in northwest Syria. So the question is, like, why? why? Um, I think if you a policy that was really focused on solving these problems, at the very least, humanitarian access, given the terrible conflict in Syria, would be something I think we can all support. That said, on your question, look, the Obama era in Egypt and the Middle East was such a tumultuous uh, time, just a, a unique moment in history um, with the Arab Spring and everything that came of it. So I think drawing, I'd be very, I'd be very, very uh, cautious before drawing direct parallels in policies. I think what you will see, though, um, is a prioritization of diplomacy. And I've just been struck, I dealt with the Libya crisis a little bit in terms of uh, ISIS in the 2014-15 timeframe. I've been just struck by the careening aspect of the Trump administration. When I was in the Trump administration, the policy just shifted like all the way over to the, the Egypt, Saudi, UAE uh, side of that divide, in the, which is a very fundamental divide and very important that we all have to be, uh, deal with in terms of Qatar, Turkey, UAE, Saudi, uh, and Egypt. Um, and now it seems to be on the other side, and the Trump administration actually has a, poli a named policy now in Libya called active neutrality. Uh, that, that's like completely meaningless. That basically means we're gonna do very little. So I think what you will see, um, we have deep strategic relationships with everybody in the Middle East, from Ankara to Doha to Abu Dhabi to Riyadh to Cairo, um, and I think what you will see is a return to very active engagement, diplomacy, empowered ambassadors. One thing about the Trump administration that is unique, nobody, and I, I've been a diplomat in the Trump administration, yeah. nobody can speak, and I'll, I'll wrap, I know you want me to wrap, nobody can speak with authority across the table from a counterpart, whether a friend or an adversary or a competitor, because the po there's no real policy. And the mm. president shifts on a dime, and everybody knows this. That, that just makes the basic, to use an American football analogy, the, the blocking and tackling, the fundamentals of diplomacy very hard. So I mm. think you'll have a return to fundamentals, diplomacy, empowered ambassadors, um, and trying to manage a lot of these problems that right now are not being managed at all. 
Yeah. I have a question for you a little later, and it's actually from uh, uh, David Petraeus, General David Petraeus, for you, Brett McGurk. Uh, I'm going to save it for the next round. But uh, I want to go now to Ambassador Dura. Uh, what about a, a return of, of, what about a second term for President Trump? It, does China feel, how does China feel about that? Do you think it's going to be, to make things better if it's a President Biden? Uh, thank you. Uh, normally, uh, we don't say something about uh, other countries' uh, internal affairs. And uh, uh, since there are some, some other questions uh, put forward uh, by, uh, about China just now uh, by Sir John and uh, Mr. Megrick, I will put it together and to give, me, to, to give my views. Number one, uh, concerning Sino-American relations, and I happen to be uh, one who is a little bit uh, optimistic if we try hard and hard enough to bring back these relations to a better course. Of course, it needs the efforts from both sides. Now, a lot of things you see happening in America about China basing, focusing on to my personal view is sort of a lot of exaggeration of China's threat. And you can see a lot of rhetoric about how China was, uh, 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 was doing uh, like Soviet Union and uh, how China was uh, uh, doing in the, uh, technology and in a lot of things. I think a lot of exaggeration there. If you go to China, what China is focusing on is really to develop itself and to maintain a peaceful, as stable relations as possible with any countries. Number one. Number two, I think for the uh, uh, question just now, Mr. Megger mentioned about the Middle East. China in Middle East, I think we, we don't think we are like the traditional powers to come to intervene the internal affairs. I didn't know, I don't know the specific issue mentioned in Syria, but I was uh, last, uh, uh, I think when last year, uh, Beirut Institute was in, uh, in your meeting, I think in, the, in uh, Abu Dhabi. I was in Turkey when America just, uh, a Trump administration uh, declared withdrawal troops from Syria, and it caused a lot of row between uh, Syria and, uh, and the Turkey. The issue like this, the principle China uh, hold is whatever you do on the regional issues like Syria, uh, refrain from intervening the internal affairs of a sovereign country. Hmm. The issue like you have mentioned about, uh, about uh, uh, humanitarian assistance rules, if there's something about this is a sovereignty within the uh, Syrian sovereign government, but um, we are not used to intervene like yeah. that. Ambassador, you know, let me ask you a question, a very specific question. Okay, okay. Uh, to impose a solution for the yeah. Syrian government, uh, it's you know, rather yeah. like to I'm have different parties to uh, talk to each other, to find a solution together. And, uh, okay, please. Yeah, please. Uh, Ambassador, you know, uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah here in Lebanon has been uh, uh, speaking to the public here, including yesterday, to say that China is willing to come in to, uh, as a partner of Lebanon and of Hezbollah uh, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of standing up to the American actions in Syria, including the Caesars Act. Is China willing to risk that uh, in order to uphold Bashar al-Assad in office or to have this partnership with, uh, with, with, with Hezbollah? Where is China on that? Since you speak of sovereignty, what happens to the sovereignty of Lebanon when you align yourself with a paramilitary force, either it is in Syria or it is, whether it is in Syria or in Lebanon? Can you please uh, respond to the specifics of this question? <laughs> Ah, that you beat me, and uh, this is very specific. I, I'm really, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not very clear about the specifics of this issue. But uh, as I said, uh, we China are very careful. Uh, no matter if it is concerning the Syria or it is uh, concerning the Lebanon, 
we will never do anything to imposing our solution or imposing our will. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll also never do anything to intervene the domestic rivalries or problems inside. We are not, we are very careful. And what we, you, if you, if you would like to listen to China's positions from beginning to the end. But this is very specific and it, it impacts a country. It impacts okay. the, uh, yeah. this country called Lebanon uh, uh, that has sovereignty as a state. Uh, uh, and there is, is, there is a party and that is member of the uh, participant, is member of the government that is saying China is ready to come in to align itself with Hezbollah and Lebanon to make up uh, uh, for what Lebanon needs while you know, uh, the United States is being pushed out of this country. Is China ready to do that? Uh, how about you send me the question, I will try to find oh. some answers for you after the conference. I really not very clear of what you mentioned the problem. Uh, okay. uh, uh, let me go to, uh, back to uh, the question from General Petreos to Ambassador Magog. Um, he says, and I'm quoting him, he says to you, Brett, he says, thanks for all that you did over the years and through Republican, Democratic, and, the Repu uh, 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 and Democratic administrations. As you look at the fight against the Islamic State now, what are the top three big ideas that you would want to share with the U.S. administration that takes place, that takes office in January 2021? And he said, thanks too. Go ahead, Brett Magal. Thank you, uh, Dave. Great to see you out there somewhere. Um, back in back land. Summit, inshallah, next year and together. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Brett. So on, on I, look, I think ISIS, the ISIS campaign, I'm writing a book about 9-11 until the end of 2018, but when you really get into the ISIS campaign, given, given what we faced in 2014 and what we were able to do, um, I think it was a success. I mean, um, and uh, in terms of three things, that's difficult, but where are we right now? I think the, the threat of ISIS in the 2013, 14, 15 timeframe, this unique phenomenon of 40, more than 40,000 uh, foreign fighters pouring into Syria, training, uh, six, over, almost 7,000 Western passport holders able to travel out of Syria into our own capitals, into Europe. Um, that threat has been significantly reduced, and that was always one of the main objectives. In terms of an insurgency threat, that is still very much there. So if I had to boil it down to three things, number one, we need to stay. Um, we are not, this is, there's a discussion in the U.S. about endless wars and forever wars. I, I, again, I try to remind people in debates about this, um, our presence to counter ISIS was not the same as when Dave Petraeus and I were doing, uh, say, the Iraq War or the Surge. Um, our, our resources were extremely limited. We had a military coalition of almost 30 military contributors. Um, just take one year in 2015, the United States spent about $5 billion total in the counter ISIS campaign. Uh, in one year of the surge, we spent almost $150 billion. Um, our casualties obviously were extremely uh, low. We want to keep it that way. So we need to stay. And stay does not mean forever war. Stay means uh, a sustainable presence that allows us uh, to keep ISIS in check. Mm -hmm. um, second, I think there is a center of gravity in Iraq when it comes to the counter ISIS campaign in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. That's something we very much need to maintain. There's a new prime minister in Iraq. He's a good friend of mine. I think there's some potential there. Um, but Iraq is under tremendous challenges. But um, that is a center of gravity. Um, and, and third, uh, the coalition. Um, ISIS is not just a threat in Iraq and Syria. It is global. And through this coalition of almost 80 partners, we developed, in a, in a pretty unique way, information sharing arrangements between military, law enforcement, intelligence. That apparatus still exists. It's really critical. We have stopped attacks from that. Um, and we just need to maintain this. And this is something that's going to go on for a long time. So stay. We need a presence in Iraq. We need a presence in eastern Syria. Um, Iraq is the center of gravity. Don't forget that. Without the, without the permission of Iraq to be there, uh, we can't be there. And the coalition is really critical. And that takes diplomacy and maintenance and a lot of work. So those would be, if I had to boil it down, those would be the three things. Thanks, Dave. I, I need to uh, bring in uh, John Sawyers on this and on a couple of other questions that are coming in. But quickly, uh, there's one to you, uh, Alistair, no, not, uh, sorry, the Brett McGurk. What is, uh, it's from Rauf Kobesi. What is likely to happen to the deal of the century if Joe Biden wins uh, American election? Quick answer, please. 
Uh, I have never worked on Middle East peace, so I will leave that, uh, I will leave that to others. All right. Uh, Paul Sullivan sends a question to both, uh, to Brett and Sir John. He says, please comment on the seeming uh, neo-Ottomanism of Turkey and how this will affect the Middle East uh, will, and politically and economically, uh, economically and particularly in terms of recovery. And I'd like Rani and Mashad to come in on that afterwards. Let me start with um, Sir John first, and then I go back to Rania and then to Brett, and then we take other questions. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. On Turkey, I think this is an important uh, question. <clears throat> I don't take a, uh, a conventional Western view on this, because I think Turkey's been... Um, uh, had really rather a rough time over the last uh, uh, five years or so. Uh, uh, and I think um, <clears throat> it's too easy to focus on some of the mistakes that President Erdogan is making, and he undoubtedly is in terms of the control of the judiciary, the suppression of the media, and so on. It's not an attractive government that he runs in, in Turkey. At the same time, um, he came into office um, and managed to restore democratic structures to Turkey, which had been threatened uh, there. He sought to join the European Union, but was rebuffed by uh, mainly by France and Germany. Um, he has developed, uh, uh, he worked to develop close ties with uh, uh, with America, but America provided a home to his uh, biggest enemy, a sort of Ayatollah Khomeini type figure uh, in uh, in uh, Gulen uh, in Pennsylvania. Now, I'm not suggesting the Americans return Gulen to uh, to Turkey, but it was very striking when the Gulenists in Turkey tried to organise a coup uh, four years ago. There were a lot of people in the West who were silently cheering them on, which I think was very misguided. So I think it's not surprising that um, uh, Erdogan and his government are very frustrated with the West. Uh, they also had to deal with, um, I'm afraid, Brett, this is in your bailiwick, uh, but the United States' choice to uh, side with uh, a group that the Turks see as a terrorist organization aligned with the PKK in their fight against ISIS. Now, it's one thing to... Uh, 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 to um, uh, uh, take on a terrorist organization like ISIS, but the uh, PKK and its affiliates, of course, even more problems in Turkey uh, than ISIS have. Uh, so it's a uh, they've had a tough time. The Turks. You can you can you can justify each of these um, uh, each of these decisions uh, uh, that the West has taken, uh, Western powers have taken. But I do think that uh, a big priority for the coming five years will be to re-engage with Turkey, uh, between Turkey and the West, and between Turkey and its main regional partners, like Egypt and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. Except, except, you know, I'm going to, uh, to respond person, with a personal opinion about what you just said about Turkey, Sir John, and from the point of view of many here in the region, that Sir, Turkey has become an incubator, if you will, of extremism, uh, whether it is in Syria, in Libya in particular, there's a lot of anger with what Turkey is doing in Libya. And I, would, I know that uh, the, the minister wants to stick to the economic uh, diplomacy, but, but I mean, maybe you wanna come in to tell us I mean, if, how, how threatened Egypt is by Turkey's behavior in next door Libya. Uh, Turkey is also, you know, it is alleged that they are leading the Muslim Brotherhood movement in, to overthrow uh, governments in Egypt and Tunisia, and to, that's the project of Rajab Tayyip Erdogan. So how, how worried is Egypt about what Turkey is doing in Libya and its project uh, within uh, the North, uh, let's say North Africa altogether, Rani al is that is that something you can talk about? I think, uh, I think that would be a question for our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Military. So in your next e-policy, maybe they can join you and, and respond to that. But I enjoyed the debate between you and Sir John. I see. On whose side are you on? <laughs> I am battling. I am. I'm have wrestling with Sir John. Are you with him or with me? <laughs> I. Uh, I. I'm. You know, it's the first time for me to see both of you, so uh, I'll keep my preferences for later. I, yeah. I think, Raghida, just to, just to come back before you go on to uh, to press on this issue. Um, I think on Libya, uh, there was an international process uh, to support a government in Tripoli. And that was undermined by a number of countries who decided to uh, support um, uh, uh, a, a, uh, a, a sort of a, a man, a, a military figure who wanted to um, uh, be a sort of successor to Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, and it was curious, I thought, that, the, that so many countries came out and undermined the United Nations process. And France was one of them. And for a brief while, the United States was another. 
Uh-huh. And the UK so, as well, Ambassador, if you remember, the UK, it was everybody who danced in the Security Council, including uh, Ban Ki-moon, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, 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 my, my, general, my general point here is that <clears throat> if the international processes, like in the UN, are not supported by all the countries of the region, then you're bound to find this uh, dealt with by <clears throat> people uh, backing different sides of a civil conflict. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think Turkey was the first country to be involved in that. Yeah, uh, I have to go back to, um, to Ambassador Hewer at one point, but Brett Magog, I need you to address, please, this issue of Turkey and whether it is an incubator of, uh, of extremism or even terrorism, as some think. What is it doing in Syria and, and, and uh, Libya as well? And I want to combine this. Uh, I know it's a different story, but try to address the same question with the Taliban militant story and the consequences to the US Russian relations, because this is a big uh, issue that is going on. Is, is the, are the Taliban militants the new ISIS? Can you address these questions together as briefly as you can before we go into the US-China relations, if we can get a little more on that? Yeah, um, if I open up too much on this, I'm just gonna, it'll take up all the time. Look, I'm from the, I, I, I went to the School of Hard Knocks on, uh, on Erdogan. I first met him in 2007 with Condi Rice. We dealt with him a lot. I probably spent more time in Turkey as a diplomat than any other country going in and out of Ankara. Um, I take some issue with Sir John uh, that we had, it was a conscious choice in terms of the YPG. Um, we tried everything with Turkey to close that border, um, even after the Paris attacks, even after the Brussels attacks, when we really went all in on the other, it was after probably a year and a half of trying um, almost everything else, hundreds of millions of dollars, I can go through the whole story. So, um, and a lot of that was working with the Turks and trying to control that border when tens of thousands of people were pouring in and out. Um, so, uh, and right now, I think if you look at what Turkey's doing, I think there is some reason for concern in the region that, uh, that we hear and read about. Um, but you know, moving just even into Northern Iraq right now, it, it, they have an operation in Northern Iraq right now that is qualitatively different than what they've done before. Um, and they have legitimate security concerns. I have on the record about that, no question. Uh, we should help them with that in all sorts of ways to make sure that they are uh, very much protected. Um, but they are moving in a very significant way into Iraqi Kurdistan. And the, the spokesman for the Iraqi Peshmerga has said, you know, Turkey's moving 40 kilometers into our territory as Iran is moving 10 kilometers into our territory uh, in the east. This looks like a coordinated effort. And um, having dealt with the Syria file for so long, um, we tend to have an assumption that Turkey's kind of on our side of this. But in fact, especially since 2015, 2016, um, the, the Russia-Turkey coordination on Syria when it comes to the U.S. presence um, is something we have to watch very carefully. And I'm, just, I'm seeing the Russians start to encroach on our presence in eastern Syria as the Turks move into Iraqi Kurdistan, and they're starting to move towards what is really our main supply line. I think this isn't an imminent crisis, but it's coming. So just something to keep an eye on. But the bottom line coming from the U.S. perspective, Turkey's a NATO ally, they're a vital ally. We have to be engaged with them. Um, we should not take sides in this regional divide. We should try to use diplomacy to maintain it so things don't spiral out of control um, and use our uh, good offices uh, to good effect. Um, so with that, I think I'll leave it there. On the Taliban story, uh, this is really a significant issue of, of domestic politics as it gets to the, just the competence of, um, of, the, of the president in terms of doing his job. I think if there's intelligence in the, in the president's daily brief, even if it's low confidence, moderate confidence, uh, that Russia might have a policy to target our forces, which would be a sea change. I mean, uh, Russia supports proxy groups and things, but to directly target each other, uh, that's kind of a no-no. And that would be something the president would need to know about, especially when he's on the phone with President Putin multiple, multiple times, five or six times after this period. So it's kind of like a shocking story here. Um, what it does to overall Russia-US relationships, look, uh, it is a fraught relationship. It's a fraught relationship because of the policies uh, of Russia and in terms of how those, how those things converge from Syria and all over the place. Um, there's also areas in which we need to work with the Russians on. And this is this era of great power competition truly is competition. I think we have to work with Russia in a number of areas. We have to, in some ways, we have to deconflict and coordinate them on Syria. I've, I led the Russia channel for a number of years on Syria. Um, but we also have to be very clear about uh, what they're doing and draw lines where lines are necessary to be drawn. And that's what I, I fear is not being done uh, right now.
Thank you very much, Brett Magar. Ambassador Yue, uh, can you please tell me about the China-India clashes, uh, recent clashes? Are they, from your point of view, have they been contained or are they uh, ready to be flare, to flare up again? Has there been any uh, you know, sort of fundamental attempt to, 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 take, to, to contain this uh, very dangerous development? Yeah, to answer this question, thank you. To answer this question, simply that it is, it is, it is contained. And uh, actually, both sides have very good uh, meeting. And, uh, uh, you know, I think this incident is, is uh, really happened in a very, uh, uh, what to say, critical time. But for China, we didn't expect it would happen. So after that, we quickly uh, contact our Indian partners. And we had a very good meeting between uh, Wang Yi, uh, our state councillor and foreign minister, with the uh, uh, Indian National Security Advisor, Aji Dobo. And uh, they reached a four point uh, agreement. Simply to say, to summarize these four points is to say both sides agree to okay. um, and, bring and, down the tension and uh, maintain the status quo and also both sides to uh, right. reduce the tension and withdraw the troops from the border areas. Uh, we have a very good, both sides. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are confident that uh, this border will, be, will not be a uh, flaring mm -hmm. up like uh, some media have said. Mm -hmm. And uh, this mechanism is from the military commander to the uh, representatives of the security of both sides and foreign minister. Very, it has, the mechanism has been working for the, all these years. So if you check up the policy briefing, uh, the briefing from the, our foreign ministry, uh, the situation now is uh, uh, coming down. And we also have the mechanism and dialogues, both yeah. from the political side and the military side. Hmm. Uh, Ambassador, some, some, as you heard, some countries are accusing uh, China of opening too many war fronts. And I'm not talking about uh, actual war as in, uh, as in engage, military engagement necessarily. As, as you know, there's been quite a number of uh, criticisms of uh, that Sir John mentioned and that the FBI uh, director also spoke of recently. So wh why is China opening so many war fronts? Is it, is it on purpose or is it because of, uh, uh, of a lack of coordination? Is there any, any uh, uh, way that you could explain to us why is that happening? And are you worried that this might impact or affect or impede your Belt and Road initiative? Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, the metaphor of the war, if that, that metaphor is appropriate, it is the war from, not from China, it's from somebody else. And the China is purely very, personally, I feel very strange uh, why all these talks about, about this, like China is doing something. If, if you say China doing anything, China is just uh, react and defend its own interests by explaining that we are continuing to go along the peaceful path of development. We are continuing to practice our cooperation with win-win approach with any countries, including America, Europe, Middle East, and the developing and the developed countries. So from China's perspective, we saw a very positive picture of the world, which is quite different from what you have mentioned. FBI director, Mr. Mayor, I heard his uh, presentation in Hudson, Hudson uh, Institute. He described, he exaggerated quite another picture. And he very weakly to compare China from somebody else, which anybody in the world can immediately say that is rubbish. And, uh, and he will continue to say this. I think in, the, in his presentation, 
questions are very well asked from the Hudson Institute to him to say, what is the exchanges, normal exchanges? What is the normal uh, cooperation? And from that, I think I come back to Sir John's question, if you would like me to uh, no, we, a few we, words about yeah. his idea. Uh, both America and China looks assertive a little bit, like a big power rivalry. I, I think the same to the same. Uh, Please, can you do that in like 30 seconds, Ambassador? We are, we're running out of time. 30 seconds, then you lost. I shall another 10 minutes, 10 seconds to you. I think assertive is uh, not a quite appropriate word. It is the situation for me personally, I last year I went to America to have the like a second track dialogue with American friends and partners. Sometimes as you sit down there with some Trump administration people, they don't they don't wait for you to say anything. They bombarded with all the accusations and uh, all the uh, uh, words of the very very militant. And, it, and they can't, they, they, they wouldn't wait for you to explain. So that's a different picture. But okay. we are not worried. I think uh, this is, uh, we still think this is uh, some people there, they have their, maybe they have their own domestic political agenda, they have right. their own uh, political ideas. But I always believe that American people, American uh, uh, different walks of life, yeah. they believe the facts, they right. believe the figures. And uh, if they see what is China really practicing in our peaceful foreign relations and cooperation, they will believe, they will know. I have to cut you off. I'm really sorry. I apologize. I really. Okay. I have... Thank you very much. Yeah. Wait, stay, stay. We have not said goodbye to everybody. I apologize to you, Madam uh, Minister, because I'm sorry I brought you into this discussion and, and you, read, you did want to talk about international cooperation and I've been very unfair to you. Can you take a couple of minutes, please, uh, uh, and, and, and like a, a minute, if you don't mind, to just tell us what, what do you hope international cooperation would look like? Uh, in the next yeah, phase. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think, I think there, ha there have been many lessons uh, over the past few months. Uh, and the, the key lesson is humility. There's not a single country who has been able uh, to, to, or has not suffered from COVID and from the implications, whether health or socioeconomic, and it's still ongoing. Uh, and when uh, there's humility, uh, it fosters collaboration. So uh, I am in no doubt uh, that the period ahead is one uh, where there is uh, more engagement. In our case, or in my case, we create uh, multi-stakeholder platforms uh, where we discuss uh, with all partners of development, multilateral and bilateral uh, uh, sectoral uh, priorities for us going forward. Uh, and uh, this really uh, pushes uh, uh, the, uh, the cooperation between countries. Egypt has very strong relationships, and I'm very happy that I'm, I'm in the economic diplomacy because uh, from the discussion today, it's, there's so much going on, uh, and I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, uh, the, the different debates here, uh, and I've been, uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, and I think the last word I want to say is, uh, in my different, uh, I mean, I come from the region, I've been brought up here, geopolitics of the region uh, keeps on evolving and changing, but, you know, that's, that's, that's our fate. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm very proud that uh, uh, I am, I'm, I'm in government, I'm able to uh, contribute, uh, uh, representing a generation that is looking forward, uh, and, and hopefully through economic diplomacy we can bridge uh, gaps and we can we can create more consensus rather than conflict. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, and I really apologize to you for having that little time to discuss the multilateralism that you wanted to address. My apologies to you. Next time we will have you on, and we'll talk about multilateralism. This leaves us with about thirty seconds to each uh, Brett McGurk and Sir John Sawyer's. Go first. Who's going to go first? Uh, go, Brett, and last word to John Sawyers. Go, Brett McGurk. 30 yeah, seconds. My last word, just kind of to sum up what I began with, we have these, ult mul these multiple crises, public health crisis, economic crisis, governance crisis. The one thing we don't have right now is a true international security crisis. And I think I'm hopeful we don't have one, particularly heading into our election, because I think we have so many problems. But 
Um, if history is telling, I think there's a, there's a decent risk there will be one. Uh, and there may well be one in the Middle East, just in terms of uh, Libya um, and what we were talking about, Turkey, we could open that up in terms of a very potential, very serious flashpoint uh, if the Turkey back forces move on certain other things. So, but that is the one crisis that is not on our plates and hopefully it'll remain that way. How about Iran, Brett? Are you thinking that there may be a clash in S Iran before the elections? Uh, I would not put it past the Iranians to do something. I think the UN is now determined, which is everybody knows that uh, they uh, launched the attack on Saudi Arabia six or so months ago. Um, so again, I would not put it again, uh, past the, my experience with the Iranians. They follow our domestic politics extremely closely. So I think they are probably calculating um, and it, there, there may well be an incident. I think it's something we need to watch very closely. Thank you very much, Brett McGurk. John Soyuz? Just as a, a final word, I, <clears throat> I think what this COVID crisis... Yes. Uh -huh. I, 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 flash, potential flash. Well, well, on Iran, um, <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the American elections, which are obviously very important. For Iranians, there's an even more important election, and that's their own presidential election next year, <clears throat> which may not only determine the succession to Rouhani, but also the succession in time to the Supreme Leader. <clears throat> the Iranians are under huge pressure at the moment, um, uh, caused by the US sanctions and uh, uh, these could be intensified uh, uh, ahead. But <clears throat> my own sense is the risks of a clash in the Middle East have gone up, but I think the Iranians uh, will probably be uh, uh, relatively calm in the sense of, in the same way they were, to my surprise, after the killing of um, Qasem Soleimani. Mm -hmm. um, and that's on Iran. That's more yeah. widely, uh, Raghadeh, if we're just wrapping it up. Seconds only, please, yeah. I think what this COVID crisis has done, it's shown the importance of competent government. And that's something which Brett was mentioning earlier. Uh, those governments that were elected on the basis of ideology or in reaction to popular anger have actually performed very badly in this uh, COVID crisis. I think if we can return to competent government, if we can have an American administration that reaches out and works actively with partners and restores American leadership, and we have a Chinese uh, uh, government which, is, which sees that actually confrontation and, and suppression inside the country is not a net benefit for China and that there's a way forward uh, uh, which doesn't require China to take those sorts of approaches. I think I, I would be optimistic about the future, but each of those three things have to fall in place. All right, I'm going to have to thank you very much, all of you, and I'm going to have to tell you uh, quickly who's going to be our guest, who are the guests for the e-policy circle number 11 next Wednesday, July 15. I will have no time to give the background. I'll just say the names. Uh, former Minister of uh, Libya, Mohammed El Dairi, uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, you all know who he is. He had so many uh, positions and uh, I'm very happy that he's going to be with us. We have Lady Olga Maitland from the UK and we have Irina Izbigleskaya from Russia. Uh, we will uh, please follow us on our social media to know and you know Beirut Institute uh, uh, channels to know the background of everybody and to join us next week at the same time. I am most grateful to all of you for making this an amazing conversation. Forgive me if I wasn't fair to everyone but the subject that uh, uh, seems geopolitics always wins against uh, economics and policy and diplomacy forgive me for that but thank you very much and have a good afternoon good evening good day goodbye everyone thank you thanks everyone